Welcome. My name is Joe Paprocki. I'm the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press, a Jesuit ministry operating out of Chicago, Illinois. And welcome to this webinar, Journey Through the Life of Jesus, a Lenten webinar with Andrea Tornielli and Sister Bernadette Reese. And they're on our screen. We'll be introducing them in just a moment, but we're so happy and thankful that they're taking this time uh, to be with us. Uh, to help us uh, journey with us during this Lenten uh, experience. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. We are in the webinar format, meaning that you will only see the panelists and you will only hear the panelists. No one else can uh, open their video camera or uh, unmute. And um, we invite you to use the chat feature to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and to use the Q&A feature for questions that you have for Sister Bernadette uh, and uh, Andrea as we continue along uh, in the webinar. You can put those questions in at any time and Denise, uh, my colleague, will be sorting those out and uh, arranging them uh, and prioritizing them for the Q&A session. And finally, uh, a recording of this webinar will be available uh, within a day or so, and we'll have that available to all of you who are registered, and it will also be available online, which I'll mention more about uh, at the end of our session today. But let's jump into in, uh, meeting our very special guest today. First, I'd like to introduce you to Andrea Tornielli. Uh, he is a, a veteran Vatican reporter and the editorial director of the Vatican Dicastery for Communication. How's that for a nice short title? Uh -huh. Andrea, welcome. And tell us a little bit more about yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my role is to coordinate all the editorial offer of our dicastery. That it means all the Vatican media. That it means radio, the website Vatican News, mm -hmm. Vatican News, the publishing editor Libreria Trice Vaticana, and the, the daily newspaper L'Osservatore Romano. Uh, we are more or less 260 journalists that are coming from 69 different countries around oh. the world. And every day of the year, every day, we are using 52 different languages. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Well, thank you for the wonderful work that you do. And in a moment, we'll uh, be inviting you to tell us uh, about the wonderful book that you have written. Uh, and that was translated by your colleague, uh, Sister Bernadette. And let me introduce uh, everyone to Sister Bernadette. She is a, a religious sister of the Daughters of St. Paul. Uh, welcome, Sister Bernadette, and tell us a little bit about what your role has been and perhaps uh, what you know about your role going forward. Sure, sure. Well, first, I'm originally from Southern California, from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and um, I am very grateful to that local church. You know, talking about a book on the life of Jesus, Pope Francis often asks us to remember the Galilee where we first met Jesus. Well, Los Angeles was mine, so... <laughs> um, and since I've joined the Daughters of St. Paul and our ministry is to evangelize with the most modern means of communication, I've lived in many other cities, Boston, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Toronto, and then the last 12 years in Rome, getting familiar with the church on a more universal level. And that's where I, for the last six years, was working in the Dicastery for Communication, uh, where I worked with Andrea Tornelli and many, many other colleagues and um I'm mostly known for my voice. Um, I'm one of the interpreters or commentators for papal events. So many of you probably have heard my voice and now you can you can see the, the other part of me. <laughs> How wonderful. Uh, what... Please, uh, if, if I can add only one word, I want to publicly thank Sister Bernadette because she's not only a very good journalist, great worker, who has been a most valuable contributor to the Vatican media, but she is also a great translator because she has translated my book with her heart and her eyes of faith. So yes. thank you, sister. <laughs> You're welcome. It was a privilege. Beautifully said. And I appreciate you sharing that because that explains why uh, we have Sister Bernadette with us because uh, from the moment that we at Loyola, Loyola Press met both Andrea and Sister Bernadette, we realized the depth of the collaboration 
that went into this book and that it would be important uh, to introduce people not only to the author, Andrea, but also to Sister Bernadette. And so throughout this uh, webinar, we're going to be asking each of them to elaborate and share insights about uh, this book and, and how to enter into it. it. It is a book that's meant to be an experience and we'll be talking more about that. Um, the book is The Life of Jesus. Uh, the introduction is written by Pope Francis himself. And this is a, a unique book um, in, in that it, it is combining three different types of, of writing in it. And rather than me talking about that, Andrea, would you share a little bit about the uniqueness of this book and what people are going to find when they open the cover? Yes, first of all, I want to say, please, Sorry for my bad English, but I oh, try to do my best. It's wonderful. Uh, the, the idea uh, was born during the, the first uh, uh, period of the pandemic when you, we were closing in our houses. But uh, a daily uh, moment, the most important moment of our days was the daily mass celebrated by Pope Francis from Santa Marta. He was accompanying us during a, a very bad period. Yes. Uh, and after, after a few weeks, uh, a, a priest uh, friend of mine phoned me and he said, Andrea, why, we are, please, think in the idea to write uh, a, a life of Jesus using the word of the Pope, because he was uh, touched by the homilies of uh, Santa Marta. First of all, my first reaction was, no, I'm, I'm not able to do, because I wrote a lot of book, too much maybe, but I never had this challenge to put, uh, to, to consider myself not as a journalist, as a reporter, but to enter in the, in the gospel, in the scene of the gospel. But when I started, I, I finished it in a few months. It was not difficult to write the book. It, but the inspiration was this idea that I received by, by this priest. And the book is the life of Jesus, the story of Jesus, using the, all the words, more or less, or the words of, uh, from the gospel, and some short comment of the Pope that can help uh, the people, the readers, to enter in the scene of the gospel. But the three different uh, uh, narration are... Uh, uh, well separated so it's, it's, it's the same story but you can find uh, quickly the, the authoritative words from the gospel and the less and less and less authoritative words that are my words and the importance of the message from the Pope. Absolutely it's just a, a brilliant combination of those three. Sister Bernadette give us your uh, impression of the uniqueness of those three types of writings being put together. Um, well, you know, I created an interesting tapestry, I would say, you know, if, if you can think of it, two different colors or styles of communication. And so we have the, the very familiar gospels, but interspersed with, you know, the descriptions, the setting up of the scene, some historical um, nuance, explanations and things like that, giving names to people who may have been there. Um, that creates the different tones and then the, the more reflective words of the Holy Father. But I mean, I, at times I was in tears, even as I was translating and I was trying desperately to see the screen. Other mm -hmm. times I was laughing. Um, so the, the book also has that element of being able to grab the, the reader and involve the reader in that way. If, if you're a reader that tends to do that, um, I found it very provocative and fresh, historically creative, et cetera. Um, and I have to admit, um, the character I was most intrigued by was Pilate, but you're going to have to read it in order to figure out <laughs> A little tease there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And uh, a little, let's talk a little bit about that, uh, the creative, uh, imaginative narrative, uh, Andrea, that you added to this. Um, We've been talking here at Loyola Press and with some other friends when we first saw the book, people were asking, well, tell us more about it. And, and we try to give quick uh, comparisons to, for, to help people. We, we compared it to the, uh, the series that's available, a uh, movie, TV, I forget. Uh, I think it's a series, uh, The Cho uh, Chosen, Chosen, and Chosen. how the 
the creators of that uh, show have added creative uh, and imaginative narrative to it. And that's what you have done in this book, that you've woven together the uh, scripture narratives with some of your own imaginative narrative. And we also realized at Loyola Press how Ignatian this was. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how all of that came together for you. I have to, to say the truth. I was unfamiliar with the Ignatian method of immersion in the gospel scene. I didn't know before. But I think I did on my own the same thing. Yes. I did not use fantasy, but imagination. Imagination is different from fantasy. I imagined myself present in the scene with a notepad in my hand, taking notes on what I was seeing, what I was hearing, the colors, the smell, the weather. I described people's faces, their characters, imagination, not fantasy. I want to underline this, but it's for me so important because the sheen, the words, the facts are those described in the gospel. They are not from my own imagination. Right. I try to make those sheen present, alive today, as if they were happening today for me, for you. Those who will read the book will say whether this attempt achieved any result. Well, the result that uh, I know it gave me, uh, and I think many readers, is that it's, it makes it fresh. Uh, so many of us have uh, entered into the gospel stories uh, time and time again. And, um, you know, let's, let's face it, if you read something over and over again, we can start to take it for granted. And so what you did was you, you placed those stories within fresh narrative that makes us want to, oh, well, it, it encourages us to use our imaginations and to, to picture uh, all of that. And so, of course, it is very Ignatian. And, of course, we have a, a Jesuit pope. And so Pope Francis was uh, most definitely uh, supportive. Uh, of this. And uh, in his introduction uh, to the book, Pope Francis talks about the, the importance of uh, encountering Jesus in the gospel every day. Uh, and Andrea, let's, let's ask you first, and we'll have Sister Bernadette uh, chime in on this. Uh, what is the Pope saying about the importance of connection with the gospel? I find that the comparison, the comparison that Pope makes in the preface is very, very beautiful. One, we cannot love another person by mail or only from a distance. Sometimes it's happened, it's happening, but this is not the normal way because love needs presence. The relationship of love needs to meet each other, to be close, to look into each other's eyes, to listen to each other. And this, and the Pope is telling us that the same happens with the gospel. To meet the protagonist of the gospel, Jesus, we need continuous contact. This is why Pope Francis invites us to read the gospel, a gospel passage every day, immersing ourselves in the gospel scenes, listening to Jesus' word because they are uh, spoken to us and tell us something new for our lives each time. This is true. Uh, um, each time that we are reading a uh, gospel scene, uh, reading a gospel page, we are discovering novelties. The, 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 the gospel is the same from 2000 years, but, but is telling some novelty for us for our lives. So, the, it's, it's so interesting and so useful, this, this suggestion from the Pope. The Pope is using, telling us, suggesting us to have a, a small paper printed gospel in our bag because he is a man, is not a digital man, our beloved Pope. But for, for us, it could be also to receive by WhatsApp or another, <laughs> another social media a short paragraph of the gospel every day or a short comment about the gospel and this is able to accompany us in our in our life connecting us with with god yes and and i, I just think it's so um it makes so much sense uh, that what the pope says and what you've echoed uh, where he says 
if we do not have daily contact with a person we love, it's difficult to love that person. And so, as I mentioned before we went on the air, I was just recently in Los Angeles for, uh, uh, for four or five days. And of course, every day uh, I'd call my wife, so we would talk uh, because we're not accustomed to being uh, apart from each other. And when you love someone, you remain in contact. And so this, it just this makes common sense and it's how we humans uh, um, act under those circumstances. Sister Bernadette, your thoughts on this? Well, I, in picking up where Andrea left off, um, it's also, I think, the, the Holy Father um, has in mind that when, as we refresh our memories, you know, we do have to refresh our memories. It actually leaves us a bit more open to that encounter with the Lord that the Pope often speaks about so often that the, it's a means by which we can prepare ourselves for a real meeting with him. Now he's not going to come physically, but there are ways that he can, he can inspire us. And that can only happen if we're kind of on the same wavelength or mind pattern that he is and we can definitely do that by picking up a thought or two from the gospels every day yes and and pope francis goes on to uh, to encourage readers uh, how then to enter into this type of uh of reading and, and sister bernadette let's continue with you uh here he he talks about um being in direct contact, oh, let me, I, I meant to switch to the next, here we go. He, he talks about how we need to approach these episodes uh, with eyes filled with contemplation. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? What does it mean to read with uh, eyes filled with contemplation? So um, this has actually a lot to do with the text itself because um, one of the aspects highlighted is how the characters in the gospel communicate with each other, not just through words or actions, but through their eyes, the looks they give each other. And so I decided to translate this as eyes filled with contemplation versus contemplative eyes. Mm. And the reason is because of that emphasis on the looks, um, but also because, you know, we say eyes filled with hope, eyes filled with joy, mm -hmm. eyes filled with tears, but hopeful eyes are different than hope than eyes filled with hope, that there's a difference. So what is that difference? Um, rather than accenting eyes that are doing something, that would be contemplative eyes, eyes filled with contemplation, it, it's like, um, it highlights that the eyes are being filled. And, and I like the way Andrea was saying, you know, it was like he was looking at a scene. It's like his eyes were being filled with something and that's eyes filled with contemplation so it's the act of receiving something yeah. rather than doing and in that way we're able then to our eyes can be filled with an encounter with god who is the one acting right yeah. so and it's a very creative posture mm -hmm. um and so when our eyes are filled with contemplation they're filled with inspiration with intuition that we've received and our eyes can't help but light up. And that's how they're filled with contemplation. That's, that's beautifully add, sorry, said, Andrea, go ahead. Sorry. If I can add sorry, only one thing, I, I was uh, so touched by a sentence of St. Augustine that he said, in our hand, we have the codes, that it means the books, the Bible, uh -huh. but in our eyes, we have the facts. That it means that the, the the story of the of the gospel, we are seeing the story of the gospel in facts that are happening in front of us. We are recognizing what is happening today, in fact, uh, uh, in the in our lives. So we need fact. We need to see. We need to touch. Faith is not only uh, uh, something that we are not blind in yes. our faith. Beautifully said, and uh, Pope Francis says uh, in this quote that's on the screen, it is true that faith begins with hearing, but the encounter begins with seeing, and both of you just spoke beautifully to, to that reality. Um, and so an important part of um, important advice 
for reading this book is the whole idea of entering into the gospel. And we touched on this already a little bit, that this is part of the Jesuit tradition. And Andrea confessed that uh, this was uh, actually something that he learned. He was doing this and then realized he's doing what St. Ignatius had uh, um, encouraged over 500 years ago. Um, Andrea, talk to us a little bit more for the average reader. Uh, what does it mean when you're telling me to enter into the gospel? Um, the example is what is usually happening when we are at Mass and we are hearing an homily. Sometimes, after, just after the reading of the gospel, the priest that is preaching the homily is talking from the scene of the gospel, is going quickly to the consequence for our life, the moral consequence, the doctrinal consequence, uh, a lot of... Uh, good of uh, good uh, advice for our life but we are not usually staying in front of the scene that it means looking at jesus looking at his attitude in front of the sinner in front of the man a woman the, the the child looking at his attitude imagine ourselves in the scene looking at jesus hearing looking at the exchange from from Jesus and the people who are meeting him. So this is so important because this is uh, uh, before to, to go to all the consequences, all the consequences are important. I'm not criticizing the homily uh -huh. of our good priests, but I'm saying that it's important to stay, to stay to the page, to the scene, because also if we know, we already know all of the gospel, is every time is new, but we yes. have to stay and to enter in the scene, to see. Sounds like you're encouraging us to, to savor what we're reading, um, to spend time with it. Uh, Sister Bernadette, this sounds uh, like a very active form of reading. Yeah, so it, it really means engaging the text, being aware of the words, verbs, especially actions, the sequence of events. Um, not just reading or hearing the text like something, oh my gosh, I've heard this so many times, you know, there's nothing new. So um, it's exactly what happened. Um, Andrea tells the story in, in the book about he was listening to the sermon or the gospel one day in the chapel at Vatican News. And all of a sudden it hit him that he realized that there were three names that had two people in the in the group of disciples. So there were two Jameses two Simons and two Judases. And it's almost like for the first time, he actually met them. Oh. So it's like he was there shaking their hands and all of a sudden, <laughs> oh my God, already a James. <laughs> That's and, neat. And, yeah, and it happened, you know, during mass like that. And that's how he entered into the text and, and something dawned on him. And then he was able to create meaning from that. And again, you'll have to go to the book to create to find the meaning he created from that. <laughs> but anyway, it's like a little window the Lord opens up um, at a certain moment in a certain place. Tiberius or Capernaum. For him, it was the chapel at Vatican Radio. That is just, you know, such great advice for us uh, about entering into the gospel and you know, to encounter Jesus uh, in this way, that it, it, it takes time, that we don't just zip through it and say, okay, Lord, what does that mean? You know, but that we really try to stand before the scene, enter into the scene, and then engage in conversation with Jesus or to just listen more closely to, to what he's saying. Um, let's get into some examples, uh, if I may, uh, because the, the book is just so filled with uh i mean it's the whole life of jesus so that's an amazing accomplishment that you pulled all this together but one of the stories that you recommended that we take a look at here uh during the short time that we have is the story of a uh, story of zacchaeus and uh first of all um andrea may tell us why you thought this story would be most appropriate for us to to delve into during our time today Really, I believe, I, I think that uh, the central message of the gospel is that of mercy. And uh, the Zacchaeus scene, the Zacchaeus epi episode is so interesting because of 
the dynamic uh, that the episode tell us. Let's look at the gospel scene. Zacchaeus is just a little curious, no more. He wants to see Jesus, but keeping his distance. That is why he chooses to look by being hidden in the branches of a tree. Remember that Zacchaeus was a publican, a sinner, a corrupt man, and he was uh, hated by everyone in the town. What happens? Jesus enters in Jericho, and when he passes the tree, he looks up, looks first at Zacchaeus, calls him first, tells him to come down, and invites himself to lunch at his house. Think of the reaction of the people. Uh -huh. Jesus, the rabbi, entering the house of the sinful, corrupt publican. What a scandal. And Zacchaeus is converted, will give half of his money to the poor. But let us stop and look at the dynamics of the, of the facts. Zacchaeus is not looked upon and treated with mercy because he is already repentant, because he is already righteous, because he asks for forgiveness. No, Zacchaeus is freely showered with mercy. And precisely because he felt loved and embraced with his merciful love, he realized that he is a sinner. What a liberating message. For me, this is really a liberating message. One does not have to be already rictus, rictus, already perfect or already repentant to be loved and looked upon with mercy. Right. That's so powerful because I think so many times we think that we have to have it all together before we encounter Christ uh, and that we have to become worthy of receiving his mercy. And as you said, Zacchaeus was just curious. <laughs> I love that. He climbed the tree just because he wanted to watch. Um, let, let's, uh, I want to read what's on the screen, and then I'm going to ask Sister Bernadette to talk a little bit uh, more about this notion of mercy, but also the narrative that we see here from uh, Andrea. So we said there are three different types of, of writing in the book, and here's one. This is what Andrea, from his imagination, said. Zacchaeus feared the crowd, knowing that due to his short stature, it would not be easy to see anything from a distance. And he was aware that people would not take it well at all if his approach was intrusive. So as the procession came nearer, he decided to watch without being seen. So Sister Bernadette, tell us a little bit about uh, this type of narration that Andrea uh, offers us and also further elaborate on this notion of mercy. So this is, this is an incredible um, instance of where we see how Andrea very craftfully sets up the scene, um, explaining things that the gospel narrative leaves out. And in this case, he also introduces what the characters are feeling, um, in this case, fear. Um, prior to that, to, to this, what we see here on the screen, he also explains that everybody else fears Zacchaeus. So we have this sense, you know, that's building up within us that th th something's very wrong here in their relationship. Um, Andrea also plays with the fact that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but in the end, it's actually Jesus who sees him. I love so that. it's, it's not just the people interacting, um, but their relationships and encounters are also being moved and perhaps determined by th these things that are built in by the, the, the feeling or by the, the desire to see and then being seen, things like this. So um, in this case, there's, there's also the aspect of being in control um, yeah. that comes out very, very, very forcefully. Um, so Zacchaeus is in control because he wants to climb a sycamore tree so that he won't be seen, right? Uh -huh. um, so all of this is coming out of Andrea's imagination, weaving, you know, the, 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 the description, his own description, but also lines from the gospel in a way that you can't really even tell who's who, you know, it's, it's wonderful. And then we get um, the reaction of real people, even like bystanders, the apostle Philip appears, you know, as they all start to notice um, 
poor Zacchaeus up in the tree. So we get these kind of, of real human um, ways of what would have been happening, you know, as people mm -hmm. realize there was a human up in that tree, you know? <laughs> and then then there's a crescendo, and then and then we get this this idea of mercy. And I'm gonna read a little bit more because it's fabulous, even in the English, if I must sure. say. Mm -hmm. Okay. It had only taken an instant. The Nazarene's eyes had rested on that tax collector, clumsily clinging to the tree's green foliage. It was like the wall of Jericho had come tumbling down once again, blown down were the walls he built to protect his corruption. That loving and merciful look invaded him. Not only had Jesus stopped for him, looking squarely at him, but he also had invited himself to Zacchaeus' home, to that house shunned by everyone, at that table that everyone else scorned, in the company that none of his neighbors would have associated with, since they were sinners, thieves, collaborationists. Beautifully read, sister. Uh, you might think of taking up a career in uh, in this. Uh, that is really just beautiful and powerful the way you read that for us. And that exactly uh, models for us how we enter into the gospel. We don't just read through it, but, but we savor the words. We contemplate the words. We take our time with the words. And that's the beauty of this narration, uh, Andrea, that you added for us. It gives us more context. I think it helps us to maybe to run around in the story a little bit more and to see it from different perspectives. And, and then you uh, intersperse it with what we see on the screen right now, scripture. And so this is uh, quoted from the, the Gospel of Luke, uh, sharing with us um, the story of Zacchaeus. And then it takes us to some thoughts from Pope Francis. So let me read this, and then, and Andrea, I'll ask you to, to, to elaborate a little bit. So this Pope Francis shared this in his uh, Angelus on November 3rd of 2013, so over, uh, uh, over 10 years ago. From that day on, joy entered Zacchaeus' house. Peace entered. Salvation entered. Jesus entered. There is no profession or social condition. There is no sin or crime of any kind. It can erase even one of God's children from his memory and heart. He is a father who waits vigilantly and lovingly to perceive in the hearts of his children the desire to return home, to be reborn. Andrea, share some of your reaction to what the Pope yeah, says here. I think that in this sentence there is all the great heart of our Pope and all the message of mercy of the gospel. We are not conditioned, no, any condition is outside the possibility, is out of the possibility to be loved and, and uh, to be touched by the mercy and by the love of God. And uh, I think that is also so interesting because the Pope is teaching us, remembering us, that uh, God is faithful. We are not faithful, but God is faithful and he is trying continuously to, to touch us, uh, to, he is acting first. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that is, is a, a, the big message, the big message of, uh, of the gospel. And today, because we, are, we, are, uh, we have read the, 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 the scene of Zacchaeus, but it's so, so good for our days now, because we have to think how it could be the reaction our reaction also, if Jesus is uh, entering in the, the, the house at home of the bad person, the baddest person, the more sinner person, the untouchable, regrettable person. So our reaction is to say, oh no, why? Why? Why not in my house, but in the house with the person that it seems to have no any reason for for going on. So I think that is the the heart of the message of of the of the gospel. The, the, Jesus is coming for first of all for the sinner. He's coming for claiming to 
to the sinner to 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 enter in in the in the embrace of of uh, of the church i have to say something interesting happened as i was reading this and i think this may happen to many other readers too as much as you've explained that it's very very clearly identified uh, which voice is speaking that it's either your narrative, scripture, or Pope Francis. I found it so woven together that it I couldn't tell at times. I would read something and I'd be like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, this is Pope Francis, because it's just woven so beautifully together. Um, and so that I, I thought that was a wonderful thing. It didn't, didn't confuse me at all. It, it helped me to put together all of these thoughts in, into one. Uh, Sister Bernadette, share with us a little bit any thoughts about this particular quote from uh, Pope Francis, but the uh, the many, many passages mm -hmm. that come from Pope Francis and, and how they are woven into this and what role they play in the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, they're very, you know, Pope Francis style and Andrea's are distinct, but like you said, they gel so well together and they're easily identifiable because we've used italics or, you know, the, the Pope's words are in quotes, et cetera. And you can also find the references very easily if you want to go and read more from, from that particular homily that, that he gave. Um, I would say um, Pope Francis his, his style is very meditative and thoughtful or reflective because again, it's, it's homilies. The context is a homily. Um, and Andrea's style is more descriptive, lively, action-oriented and imaginative. Um, Pope Francis draws meaning from the text. I think that's what he's providing. Um, yeah. Whereas um, Andrea is describing and um, telling the story. Um, and so, it's almost like from Pope Francis, we can um, apply what he has to say um, to our relationship with the Lord and also to our spiritual lives. He wants, I think he wants to touch our hearts yes. um, by unpacking the Lord's message for us. And so the intertwining of, of these passages, um, you know, the description, also description from the Gospels, but, you know, it's very um terse in the sense that it's it's limited right it's very wow. factual and um well not factual in the historical sense but um but and then the reflections creating the meaning is what we're getting from pope francis and i think there it creates a beautiful symphony but but moving very well in and out of the different instruments if you want to put it that way or moods you know that each style creates uh, that's a great image, a symphony. It really, it really plays like a symphony when you read this. Uh, we're just past halfway through in our uh, time together with uh, Andrea Tornielli and Sister Bernadette Reese as we talk about journeying through the life of Jesus. And I see that there are some questions that are compiling in the Q&A feature. So please do use that feature if you have questions for Andrea and Sister Bernadette. And in just about uh, 10 minutes, uh, we will uh, do uh, some Q&A with them. But let's look at one more uh, story then very appropriate for Lent. Holy Week is upon us. Um, Jesus washes the feet of, of his apostles. Uh, and, and what we're going to do with this, uh, a little different here, is uh, we're each going to take a turn reading a slide and then uh, ask uh, you to, to make a comment or two about it. But let me read the, the first slide here. Um, in which we're going to read the, the scripture passage uh, from Jesus Washes the Feet. Uh, and then perhaps uh, Andrea and Sister Bernadette, just a couple of brief thoughts uh, about uh, what this, how this sets the stage. Um, so, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Andrea, what kind of mindset are you uh, inviting readers to get into as we approach this story? 
Uh, I, I think that uh, in in this gospel page, there is a real reversal that takes place. The great one is the one who serves. So the the right way to to live for our lives are to serve. That is a real reversal of all the ideology of 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 our world. Uh, about power, about uh, happiness, and the the real, real reversal because the real power is is to be servant. The the greed is one who who serves. So this it, it is one of it's the heart of the message of the gospel. It's what's happened with Jesus and with his uh, uh, totally grateful sacrifice for for us. God was servant. God, God will, wants to serve us. Yeah, that's a powerful reversal. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I, I'm going to ask uh, Andrea to, to continue. Uh, would you read for us what's on the screen? And this is your narration now. And then, uh, so read this for us, and then share a couple of thoughts about what your what climate or atmosphere you're trying to create in your narration. By now, they were used to Jesus acting in ways that left them speechless. This time, they were moved. The Nazarene wanted to demonstrate with a concrete example that service he had just spoken to them about. This was the service, the only activity that was worth trying to be the best at. So, I, I think that is so interesting. I, I try to demonstrate the the change that he, that happened in the mind, in the life of, of the apostles. The, they were simple person, uh, fishermen. Uh, not, not, not only one was uh, uh, one with religious uh, uh, ideas or no one was a, a priest, uh, <laughs> a rabbi, or simple person. And uh, Jesus, in during his public life, he was educating day by day them with his teaching, but also, uh, and, and more, with, with the examples. And in this time, he, he wanted to demonstrate with a g simple gesture that uh, uh, what, what is the meaning of service. He, the rabbi, was washing their feet. And then we move into, again, seamlessly, uh, the words of Pope Francis. And Sister Bernadette, Bernadette, I'll ask you to read this and then share with us your insights on what Pope Francis is shedding light on in this story. I'll wait for the slide. There we go. Jesus does something that the apostles do not understand, washing their feet. At that time, this was unusual. It was it, this at that time it was usual. It was customary because when people went into a home, their feet were dirty with the dust of the road. And they would wash their feet at the entrance to the house. But this was not done by the master of the house, but by the slaves. That was the task of a slave. And like a slave, Jesus washes our feet, the feet of his disciples. Jesus' love is so great that he became a slave to serve us, to heal us, to cleanse us. Expound on Pope Francis. Yeah, now, this is why it's so important also to have where he said these words, because just as the setting that the Gospels give us of the Last Supper is very important, so is the setting of a homily. And in this mm. case, the Holy Father is in a prison. Mm. He's he's celebrating the Mass of the Lord's Supper with the very people that many of us, like the people who were judging Zacchaeus, that's the type of people that he is speaking to. And this, this scene, therefore, it has like an added 
gravity or seriousness to it because the Lord is also going to wash their feet in the person of Francis, right? right. Because this has a liturgical, um, we've, we've made this part of our liturgy too. So in other words, it, making that connection for us makes this passage so much more powerful yeah. by adding this particular homily of the Pope to this particular gospel passage. So. That's very important for us to know, and we appreciate the fact that you you did that in this book by telling us where these uh, comments came from, the context of them, because I'm sure all of us have seen pictures or video even of Pope Francis washing the feet of people who are imprisoned. And so once again, it stimulates our imagination to not only be list looking and reading the words, but then picturing and maybe it will also compel people to go online and look for pictures of that to, to further see in action uh, what's taking place. And um, all of this is leading to the hope for this book. And this is where I'm going to ask you to sort of summarize your thoughts before we get into the, the Q&A. Um, Andrea, you said it in the book, thanks to the testimony of his friends, the gospel, the story of Jesus' life, takes on its full meaning only from the awareness and experience that he, the Nazarene, is alive today, and that without him we can do nothing, and that it is possible to encounter him today in exactly the same way people encountered him 2,000 years ago. Would you elaborate that on that a little bit? I, I highlighted that part. It's possible to encounter him today. How so? It's because uh, if the gospel uh, is not uh, happening today, if the encounter with Jesus is not happening today, we are not, uh, the, the, the faith has not meaning. It's, it's simply a thing of the past. Mm. So we need each day, every day, we need, to see, to encounter, to meet Jesus in the eyes, in the voice, in the, in the body of our brother and sister, especially who are suffering, especially person who are telling us uh, testimonies, stories that, for our, that are touching us and uh, are teaching us how the gospel is uh, present and, and God is acting in their lives. We need this. During an homily for the, the epiphany of 2017, if I remember well, January 2017, the Pope spoke about the kings, the Meiji, that uh, they have a, a view with nostalgia because they are, they are nostalgic of, of, uh, of God, the desire of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need to go out. They need to go to looking for uh, Jesus, looking for the face of God, that is the face of Jesus, in our brother and our sister, especially the person who is suffering. This is the way in which it's possible to encounter him today, that it means to be touched by the reality, to be touched by the story of the people we are meeting in every condition of our life, in the simply meeting and encounter, to be there looking at, because Jesus is, is, is there. Jesus is telling us mm -hmm. something for our lives. Sister Bernadette, add your thoughts. Uh, how is it possible that we can encounter Jesus today through reading entering into a book so um i'll i'll give a specific example actually um so i clearly remember one day um it was you know from luke chapter four you know jesus getting up in the synagogue and reading and the action with the scroll caught my imagination so he asks for the scroll he takes the scroll he unrolls it he reads it etc hands it back. And it was like in my mind, like a mantra as I was going to mass, but there was also something like a premonition that this, this was going on inside of me. And um, when I went to the office that day, I found a letter on my keyboard. And this was just after the, the lockdown um, okay. and, and having done Pope Francis masses every morning with him accompanying 
him with English with the translations. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it's almost like I realized that was my scroll. Mm -hmm. I picked up that letter and it was, it was, it's weird to say how it was, but it's almost like I was there in the scene, except I was the one taking the scroll and opening it and reading it. And it was actually the letter, a letter from someone, uh, a family in the United States who had heard the, who had participated in the Pope's masses and contacted me because I was a name they knew because of the translating I was doing. And they wanted to tell me about the suicide of their son and, and uh, brother. It, it, it was, you know, I remember sitting down and the rest of my day was just like, it went ahead with that particular experience, but that how they entrusted to me this yeah. story and uh, but not just to me but to jesus mm -hmm. who i had been carrying because of that connection that i had made with him that morning with that particular gospel so that's one way it can happen thank you for sharing that sister bernadette uh, both you and, and andrea thank you so much for uh, laying out for us uh, your very deep and beautiful thoughts for how to enter into the gospel and providing us a tool uh, for doing it. Uh, the book that uh, Andrea, you've written, and Sister Bernadette beautifully translated uh, The Life of Jesus, and what a beautiful Lenten experience for us. Uh, so we thank you for that. We have time now for some q and I'm going to invite my colleague Denise to come on board. There she is. And without further ado, Denise, looks like you have a number of questions to choose from. Okay. Um, Marlon asks, Andrea, how did you go about finding just the right quotes from Pope Francis? They fit so well and further illuminate the scene. It, it, it's not so difficult because, uh, as you know, all the texts of the Pope are online in the Vatican.va website, and there are books recollecting the homily and all the teaching. Uh, it means Angelus and, and uh, other speech of the Pope. So it was not difficult. I, I, I chose all the paragraphs, simply the paragraphs that are helping to enter in the scene with the meaning of the scene, and, and, but uh, helping people to, to enter in the scene. But it is not so difficult because uh, I wrote a, a different different books about about this pope and the previous popes so i have i usually use to 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 read and to find the quotation of the pope or of the popes for my daily job okay next one denise nancy wonders uh, is there any recommendation to refer back to the bible at certain times of reading the book or should we just read the book um, I don't think reading the book because more or less all the important words of the uh, of the gospel are inside the book. Obvious is that if the same sheen, more or less, uh, you can find the same sheen in in one of the gospel or the other or the third. Obvious that I choose the one or I put together two different. The same scene with a few words for one and other few words for for another, but you can find all the the scene of the gospel. So, the the words of the gospel are already inside the book, but at the end of the book you can find the reference uh, of uh, for each chapter of the book, uh, the, the the correspondent chapter of the gospel that I used. And I would, if I can add to that, I would. Uh... Uh, I would think that if this book inspires people or compels them to go and pick up the Bible and read the Gospels, that that's not a bad thing. No, yes, of course, uh, absolutely, absolutely. No, I I will say that is not necessary for understand the the right. the book, but uh, of course. <laughs> go ahead, Denise. And thank you for pointing out that the references are in the book because we had a few questions about that. Um, Mary wonders if you could elaborate a bit more on the use of imagination, how it's not fiction using the imagination to explore these stories, and also says maybe the eyes of the heart play into that? 
Yes, I think that I, I want uh, coming back to the underlining the difference between imagination and fantasy. The fact is that I want to be faithful to the gospel, not adding strange things that are my dreams or my fantasy. I use my imagination for helping people in entering the scene, but without changing the scene or without adding a lot of things to, to, to the scene. I simply tried to help the people to smell, to, to, to see the color. I, I give a name of all the, the, the persons quoted in the gospel, also if in the gospel they are uh, without name. So it's a news of imagination that is simply helping for entry in a real story and know to fly with, with the fantasy. Sister Bernadette, add, add some of your thoughts to that too. How is uh, imagination not, um, how is it different from fantasy um, and fiction? Mm -hmm. I think um, Andrea really, really said it well. And like, there's no, no additional scene that didn't happen there or hasn't been handed down in tradition. So we do have a figure of, of one of the women coming uh, to Jesus along the way of the cross, but she doesn't have the name Veronica because, he, and he explains that historically these women were there and they would have been providing some a sedative, for example. So sometimes he's adding actual historical uh, context, which I found fascinating. So for example, with um, Joseph, we learned that as a carpenter, he probably, um, would have helped on the building of a local town named Sepphoris. So for those of us who don't have the, the ability of having scripture studies, this is another way of building on our, our understanding of other things that would have made, uh, made their life what it was and how, you know, he, that's how, for example, he makes the connection then how Jesus used so many building images and his parables and things. So he, this is the type of way how he's using his imagination um, to to use the material that's already there, and then to make other other connections throughout the story. Yeah, I think this is a, a wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> thank you to the the person who wrote the question because uh, for many of us, we're not accustomed uh, to this notion of using our imagination. And it's very Ignatian. St. Ignatius taught us to use our imaginations. And there's a great story from uh, the life of St. Joan of Arc as she was being questioned by the authorities uh, about, uh, you know, hearing God speaking to her. And the authorities said, oh, it's just your imagination. And her response was, of course it is. How else would God speak to me? And that, that's just really a, a very good way of putting it, that imagination is not something to be uh, afraid of. It's not flights of fantasy. Um, as long as we, as Andrea has done, are not adding or taking away from the stories, uh, but just creating maybe a little more context to help us relate to it. Denise, time for one more. Okay. Um... Nancy wonders, is the book in chronological order? Or did you approach it in a different way? Absolutely, yes, it's chronological. I wrote uh, uh, some biographies of, of uh, popes or saints, and I like uh, the chronological development of their life because our life are chronological. <laughs> so uh, I think that it, it also I try to put together the four gospel in a chronological line and uh, each chapter, introducing each chapter, I put an idea of possible dates and if it's possible also the season, if it's possible also the month and when it's possible also the date because it's important to underline this connection with the story because the Catholic faith, the, faith, the Christian faith, the faith in Jesus Christ is not uh, something uh, uh, without time. It's something who happened in, in a special moment, a special time of the history. He divided our history in two different parts and also non-believers each day that if you are using an email, uh, or they're watching a calendar, they are calculating the days from the date 
supposed date of uh, the, the, when Jesus born that we know that is not exactly because it was born a few years before the date, uh, the supposed anno zero. But it's important to underline the, the importance of the history. For, for this reason, I use the chronological way of uh, for explaining the life, and I try to put uh, more information about the dates. I enjoyed that feature of uh, the dates being uh, added and, and kind of like a suggestion that this is quite possibly the date it took place on. I think it just adds to the, the historicity of our story that Jesus was a historical person, but it also uh, it really reinforces the notion of the incarnation, you know, that, that this is, you know, a story that took place in the flesh. And uh, that was a really wonderful addition. Thank you, Denise, for uh, sorting through questions and bringing them to us. We're, we're out of time. I uh, wish we could go on and talk longer with Andrea and Sister Bernadette. Uh, but uh, I can't thank you uh, uh, enough for uh, sharing this time with us and for parting, providing us with this beautiful book, uh, which is on the screen. Uh, and uh, as I ask each of you to say a couple of closing words, uh, folks, you can take a look at the screen and see there's a QR code there to uh, reach the book. There's also Loyola Press store .loyola Press com. Uh, I'll say more about what's on the screen, but um, Sister Bernadette, uh, a few last words from you. Um, well, it was a delight for me uh, to translate it. And, um, you know, I do hope that being the, the mediator <laughs> or the musician playing the original score, right? Someone else wrote the original score. Um, I, help, I hope that even, you know, if some of you pick it up during Lent, that you too will be able then to, to begin your own journey in using your imagination into the life of Christ. And thank you for the wonderful job you did on um, not only translating, but on adding such depth of thought and prayer to this whole conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, Andrea, your final thoughts for our viewers. First of all, thank you to you for organizing this webinar. Thank you to all the people who are joining us uh, this conversation. Thank you, Sister Bernadette, for translating the book. And my hope is that this book could help someone to meet the protagonist of the gospel. I was thinking in this book for also for people that are not using the reader of the gospel. And they try to use this book as a, as a novel, but try but uh, remembering that is not a novel because it's something that's happened. Yes, I can easily see this book being used uh, in many adult faith formation settings. I can see it being used in catechumenal settings where you're introducing people to the entire story of Jesus to just invite them to, to read through this as they go through that process. So many different ways this can be used. So thank you, Andrea, uh, for this wonderful book. It is The Life of Jesus by Andrea Tornielli and the introduction written by Pope Francis. The QR code is on the screen if you'd like to scan that to go directly to the information on the book. You can visit store.loyolapress.com. And when you look for the book, uh, please also notice uh, that there are extras uh, available. There was a discussion guide, which uh, I had the privilege of writing, a discussion guide for this wonderful book. And that can also help in terms of gathering groups of people together to read and discuss this book or for yourself doing it uh, as an individual exercise. There's our 800 number on the screen as well. If you call during business hours, you'll speak to a live human being to ask about the, the life of Jesus. And finally, the recording will be available soon at ignatianspirituality.com, as well as a link being emailed to each of you who has registered. Uh, my prayer for all of you is that you have uh, abundant blessings, receive abundant blessings during this Lent, and that as we uh, enter into more deeply the life of Jesus, we will truly encounter him and deepen our discipleship. Thank you all for being with us. Until next time, this is Joe Peprocki. God bless.